Hi, George. Hey, Herb. How you doing? Great. Tuesday again. Hi, Ethan. It's great to have you here and see you once again. Ethan is good a uh, good friend of mine and now is going to be a good friend of the podcast. He's in Burlington, Vermont. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. So, Ethan, we usually start by asking some personal questions. And we know you live in Burlington. We know that you're a new dad. How's that going? It's going great. Going great. Eight months in. I don't know anything about how to be a dad still because it changes every week, but it's amazing. Uh, I've learned a lot, though. That's usually the journey, you know, even for pediatricians when you have a newborn at home. It is not like the textbook. I always kid that the kids never read the textbook. They just do what they want. Yeah. Yeah. There's no algorithm for raising kids either, as many people would like. (laughs) Yeah, no technology to solve for the fact that two minutes prior to us jumping on here, I had a, uh, a screaming baby that went down for a nap and she would not stop. So I was worried that you guys weren't going to be able to hear me. Well, that's, that's okay. That's we're, we're pediatricians. We're used to the screaming. <laughs> and I've been to meetings with my son in tow. <laughs> so <laughs> there's yep. nothing new. Well, you have a very, very interesting, I would say a fascinating career through the intersection of healthcare and technology. I always start with why the medical industry? Why did you get into this? Good question. I, I grew up in, in the industry because uh, of my mother, actually. So she was an orthopedic nurse practitioner, um, an x-ray tech, and then she ended up being an entrepreneur. So as I grew up, I was born in 82. She launched a, a business in 90 with a co-founder. And that business was based on her master's thesis when she got her MBA around helping physician practices improve operations and finances. What started as a consulting practice turned into a consulting and revenue cycle management, billing consulting, and, and she did that my entire childhood. So I was a, an early employee licking stamps for, for patient statements and HICFA forms and, uh, and vacuuming floors. And so, you know, growing up in that environment, I learned a thing or two and, and just was excited about the opportunity, especially as the EMR was in its, its infancy. So that's, that's kind of how it all started. Okay. You've run two very successful companies. Some listeners are interested in what was the tipping point at OHMD? Boy, it's, it's a moving target. So OMD is always going to be something that, that evolves over time and, and how we classify success in, in that company. Um, Changes. I mean, I think pre-COVID it was it was one thing, and post-COVID it's a different thing. But I think ultimately, what it means to me to run a successful company is that you're solving an important problem that you're passionate about. You're doing it at as much scale as it makes sense, you know, as you can possibly scale to, reaching as many people as you can, doing something important. Um, and then I have a kind of a third qualification for that, which is. I, I believe in running business, businesses in a sustainable way. So raising tremendous amounts of money and running at a loss, I think can work in a lot of places and it makes sense in a lot of places, but in healthcare, that oftentimes doesn't make a ton of sense. So building a real company that can sustain itself. Um, yes, you can still have investors. Building something that's kind of built to last is, is important to us. So I think that, that journey that we've been on over the last eight years It's fluctuated here and there, but those are the things that have kind of, I I guess, led me to believe that we are successful. So what's important to you throughout your career is the centerpiece of the medical relationship, the conversation between a doctor and a patient. And if I, if I read it correctly, you don't think technology is a solution. Technology is a tool that allows for that relationship to be strengthened. Yeah, without a doubt. It's not what we do at OMD. The easiest way to describe what we do is we're a patient conversation solution. That doesn't mean that that we don't embrace automation when it makes sense. It doesn't mean that there aren't other you know tools that we've built 
or forms or integrations or all, all of the other kind of technical componentry of OMD. But the core of what we do is giving patients access to their care in a really simple way because we believe that the conversation with the patient is what makes healthcare unique. It's, you know, it's, it's healthcare is emotional and oftentimes painful and stressful. And it's this, it's different than anywhere else. So ha- being able to have a conversation with someone is critical to getting the care that you need. And that's what we've always believed in when we first, and we can talk about this too, but when we first built this thing, everybody in the industry was going toward automation and we were zigging when everybody else was zagging. We said, okay, fine. Automation plays a role, but let's solve for what the patient needs first. And they want that access and empathy and, and to feel like someone cares. And that's where we focused our energy. Okay. And then you mentioned another thing that's always been a, a great interest of me. I, I don't understand for example, the Uber or the Lyft model, where they're public and they're losing oodles of money and they have really huge valuations. And you said you want to build a business around earnings, not revenue, not eyeballs, and not users, not growth, but earnings. And that's what you think is sustainable in the med tech side of the, of the investment equation. I think most of the time that's true. I mean, there are certainly cases for spending tremendous amounts of money to get to scale so that you are the market leader and no one else has access uh, to the market in the way that you you do because you box them all out. Like there is a case for that for sure. The, but the way that I think about it in, in healthcare is there very rarely is a winner take all solution in healthcare because there's such a diversity of users, different specialties, different size organizations, different problems to solve. How many different EMRs are there? And and yeah, it's, you know, oftentimes boils down to Epic and Cerner and Athena, you know, there's, you know, the top 10, but there's also a hundred or 500 others that that have the market. And so I think to, to assume that you can build a single solution that, that, captures 90% of the market or hundred percent of a market like Amazon, for example, talk about, you know, raising a tremendous amount of money and running at a loss for a long time. It's healthcare is just, just different. And so I, I believe in it's okay to, to raise money. It's okay to focus on growth. And we've done those things, doing it to set yourself to be on the fundraising treadmill and always wonder if you're going to live to see another day. It's just something I think is really hard to do in healthcare and risky. So, Ethan, what I've experienced with fundraising and stuff, I've worked with a couple of startups and they, in medicine, I mean, the tech industry, what they do is they'll have an idea, they'll make a PowerPoint presentation, have somebody sell it really good, and then somebody will throw money at you. And then you'll build the product. We're dealing with people's lives. You cannot deal with making a mistake. You're not allowed to have one error. One error could be one life, you know? I've been accused of flying a plane and building it at the same time, but at least I have some guidance and instructions. The tech world, they just fly and figure out as they're going along. Yeah. And that's, I think that's a, an inherent challenge in technology a, across the board, right? Like you have to find what we call product market fit. And to do that, you have to navigate so many twists and turns and and make these mini pivots and figure out what your product is actually solving for and then how to get people to pay you for it. So it's challenging and building technology is not easy. And so I think you're, you're spot on healthcare is different. The old Facebook adage, uh, move fast, break things. That's not good for healthcare. You do have to like approach solving problems in a really calculated way way. Understand that healthcare is a little bit different. It's not about, you know, if you change the newsfeed on Facebook and a bunch of people freak out, that's one thing. Updates on when I'm eating for lunch or something. So in healthcare, when you make changes to the system, it, it needs to continue to work the way people expect it to. And, and it, you know, you just have to be careful. So I think that is unique to healthcare. Another thing that's unique is you're dealing with physicians. And what does a physician do? He has to be perfect all the time. Yeah. And so now you're balancing two worlds. You're never going to have yeah. perfect technology. It always breaks. It's true. Yeah. And I've been, I've been in health tech for as long as I've been out of college, really, I mean, even before, right? Like I was 
one of the first things that I did in my professional career was started working with all scripts in my last company to help them roll out electronic medical records to practices and large health systems down where in your neck of the woods, we worked for many years with Northwell. We've seen what can happen with software, how hard it is to build software and specifically for doctors. I've worked side by side with doctors for decades now. It's really hard to be perfect on the software front so that doctors can be perfect on, uh, in their jobs. So I, the challenge is real. I'm going to talk about some of my favorite people. And uh, on a conversation we had a long time ago, you shared um, what your eyes saw in Boston with Athena Health's war, uh, war Room. And it was a fascinating description. Would you care to share that with our audience today? Well, I've seen, yeah, I've spent a lot of time with Athena, with Athena leadership and other partners. And we've been a partner of Athena for many years now. We think that they're a special company, even with everything that they've been through. We think that they've solved problems in a different way, in a more forward thinking way than, than many uh, other healthcare companies. And, and one of the things, there's a million things I've seen within our Athena relationship over the years that are amazing. But I think one of the things that, that was amazing to me, and I, I think this is what you're, I was down at the Athena office a number of years ago, and they have these control centers in, in their offices where they're watching, have all of their customers that are going live or within some phase of go live that are kind of up on these, these monitors in these rooms. They have these metrics to kind of show whether a customer is being successfully using the system or not. Are they what we call key success indicators or, or uh, leading indicators of success? Like they have a visual and a room full of people that are looking at these visuals and saying, how is the system being used in these practices? Is it, is it being used in a way that's going to make this practice successful? And they have so much data on what that looks like because of the way that system is built, the way Athena is architected, gives them so much insight into what, uh, a successful customer looks like. And so I've always been amazed by the way they use data, the way they can leverage that data to make their customers successful. And I've never seen anybody do, you know, other, other companies do anything quite like that. So I think that's one thing that's amazed me about them, but we were talking uh, just before this call about John Bush and I think like a lot of health tech entrepreneurs, he has been someone that that has inspired many of us to do better and, and build things that solve important problems. Jonathan Bush failed at his first venture, right? He tried to build a, a bunch of clinics. And as he describes it, what uh, did him in was that he didn't know how to build. His second, if I get it correct, his second venture was Athena Health. Um, well, I think they were sort of one in the same, the way I understand okay. the story. So if you think about it, and you could describe it differently. The reality of the situation is I wasn't there to see it, but that's a pivot that, that happened there, right? It was OBGYN practices that they had. They realized that there was an opportunity to solve all this billing chaos and make it easier. And so they said, like, why can't we build software to accomplish this in a way that makes these practices run better? makes them successful so that they can focus on patients. And that's a model that we see a lot in tech where I, I have some good friends and some of our investors who, who founded a company up here in Burlington, Vermont called dealer.com. Dealer.com originally was a, a software that was built for a specific car dealership. They realized like, oh, we can manage inventory and we can manage you know, web content, make sure the cars are available when people are shopping online. And they realized that like, oh, we can sell this. We can sell this to any dealership. They ended up becoming a multi-billion dollar company because they realized like they felt the pain point. I think John felt the pain point in those OBGYN clinics. And that's a kind of a, an important part of building something is that you feel the pain point yourself. If you understand that pain and you can be creative and, and motivated enough to solve the problem in a unique way. That's kind of the ingredients for a really successful company. You would say that Jonathan had a great impact as a leader in your career. 
for sure. When I see him on TV, I can't imagine being with him in the same room because I'm hyperactive and, you know, very vocal and opinionated. I can't imagine what would get thrown between him and I. But what what is it like to be in a room with Jonathan? And how does he motivate you to be the best Ethan that you can be? Yeah, in all of our partner meetings with Athena over the years, he would always be really involved in all of the conversations and he would come in and he would do a, a you know, kind of a half day session with all of the partners. I think that every single year there was some unique or, or number of thoughts that he would kind of plant in everyone's head. Like, this is how we should be thinking about the future. So I can give you kind of an example. One of the things that, that I remember from one of those conversations, probably multiple of them, was him talking about how Athena had an opportunity to be an open kind of an open API for healthcare. Like let's not worry less about building walls around Athena and let's open it up so that the, the patient data can be used to treat patients across the care continuum. He made comparisons between what the way Athena thinks about the world and the way other EMR vendors think about the world. It made all of us think like, wow, like imagine if every physician or clinician out there treating a patient had access to all of the data that they could ever ask for on that patient from across different EMR vendors. There's no, no walls. The integrations are straightforward and they just, they just exist. And I think that was a future that he illustrated for us that Athena was really focused on. I think they still are today, even without him there. I think it's, it's kind of in their DNA to think about an, an open healthcare ecosystem where data moves freely because what matters is that the patients get the best possible care. And without that data moving freely, the patients don't get the care that they need. And so that's something he was talking about many years ago. It's just, oh. you know, when, when, when we, we were all, we've been griping for 20 years about the cost of interfaces. Every time you want to do move data, you're paying five right. to $10,000. Right. And then you pay right. it again when, when the vendor tells you you need a different one and, and how crazy that is. Right. And, and who, who, who does that hurt the most? The patient. And so I think those types of thoughts are just the ones that that's always sat with me. Like, man, we can think differently about healthcare than it's been thought about. And he was always that guy thinking five years ahead. Well, so George's dad has an interesting saying, right? Do great care and the money will follow. Chase the money and neither will follow. Okay. And that's what sounds like what Jonathan does, right? Let's do great. And then the money will follow. Yeah, I, I, I think that's probably in line with the way he thinks about it. That's just funny. You brought that up. I was thinking about this uh, before jumping on here. I used to talk about in the early days of OMD where I wanted perspective. I talked to different doctors and get their perspective and have them shoot holes in the plan. And this is many, many years ago. And of all the conversations I ever had, I would always talk to doctors and say like, hey, like there isn't. I've never met a physician who prior, who care about people. You're a physician because you care about people. You want to make them healthy. That's your top priority. And everyone agrees with me over all the years, except for one guy. Nope, I'm in it for the money. And, <laughs> but everyone else, this is like hundreds of conversations. So I think that, that if you do, if you do good work, if you take care of people, you know, that's the most important, you know, first step. There's all sorts of other variables that need to be taken care of. But if you're doing that, then you're in it for the right reasons, then the rest is all solvable. Yeah. But I think a lot of physicians feel that the technology gets in the way of doing good work. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting anecdote. In the early days of way before OMD, back when I was working on electronic medical record systems, I was side by side with a lot of physicians learning the EMR for the first time in the mid 2000s. I've seen everything. I once saw a doctor throw his own laptop on the ground and kick a hole in the wall of his own office. So I, I know how frustrating that must be to, to not be able to deliver care the way that you want in, in a way that's intuitive and that helps you provide better care. I think that's a, a, something that we took to heart when we built OMD. We said, we don't want to do, we don't want this to feel like the EMR at all to the physician or to the front office or to the, you know, the care team or any, anyone else using it. We want this to be 
an intuitive software that actually makes their day better and easier and also solves the patient problem at the same time. And so when we do implementations, and this is, is not by accident, it's, we don't, A, we don't call them implementations because that induces heartburn with some people. We call them activations and our activations are one hour. So we do a one hour training and that's all you need to use the system because it's built intuitively. The reason it's built that way is because we invested probably when it felt uncomfortable. I can tell you it felt uncomfortable hiring top, kind of like top, to, top illustrators and, and user experience designers in the early days to build something intuitive. But I can tell you that every dollar that we spent on building a user interface that was intuitive and easy to use was worth it because here we are, we have a product that just works for people and makes, makes their lives easier. We never, we never want it to be that, that bad software that got in the way. So we'll get back to design because I think design is key. And if you don't have the right designers from the beginning, you won't have a product, but I'll hold that thought. I want to yeah. know if you had much interaction with Glenn. Glenn was at all scripts and now Lavongo, and he's one of the managing partners at Seven Ventures, I think it's called. Um, Seven Wire, yeah. Seven Wire. And how is that like, that interaction? How is it different from Jonathan? They're not that, I mean, similar guys. And I'm not 100% correct on that, but I was around Glenn a lot as well. I, I've met him a number of times over the years, but I worked, when I first, at my last company, I stood up a partnership with Allscripts, it was 2000 and five or 2006. And that was pretty early days for all scripts. And so I, I recall going to these all scripts, uh, customer annual meetings as, as both a partner. And we were sort of on behalf of our customers who were using their platform. And Glenn, first of all, has a tremendous amount of energy. You knew he was like a runner. He slept four hours a night. He did, you know, just was capable of anything. And so I think they're, they're similar in probably a number of ways. The one thing I took away from Glenn, and this is probably something his marketing team put together, but he said a lot, is they had this acronym that they used internally at Allscripts. And the acronym, I can't even, it's, it's if doctors don't use it, nothing else matters. Because at the end of the day, they could sell software. And if they had a great sales team, that's going to get them to a certain point. But if you can't build something that doctors find value in using, then why are, why are we here? And how do you build a company when that happens? And so that's something I, you know, just kind of internally took and flipped a little bit and said, why are we doing any of this? If, if we can't build software, something that patients use. And so to me in, and this is nothing, nothing that we formalized in an acronym that we share on our, our all hands meetings at OMD, but if patients don't use it, nothing else matters. And the reason that, that that's an important thing to understand is that go back to a Microsoft health vault or, you know, the patient health or personal health records, patient health records, systems that have been built over the years that are now gone. Google had one as well. The, the reason those, those were built for good reasons. It was the idea was let's get patients their information so that they can manage it in a central place. Those systems died because there wasn't enough, there wasn't enough, enough incentive to bring patients into them to use them in a meaningful way. And that then kind of became the patient portal story. You can, patient portal is valuable. And no, you can't tell me, and I'll, I'll never tell anyone that the patient portal isn't valuable. The problem is it's only valuable to 20% of your patients. And so what happens with the other 80%? Because it's really hard for most organizations to scale portal across all of their, their patients. And the data is very clear on that. Kaiser has been successful because they're an integrated delivery network and they're motivated to drive patients into the portal. For but for everyone else, even the best portals out there in the space don't achieve a scale within a patient population beyond, oftentimes beyond 20, 30%. And usually those are for limited use cases, paying your bills and scheduling an appointment, checking on labs. If patients don't use it, nothing else matters. To us, it was about looking at consumer trends, figuring out what technology people were using and what we thought they'd continue to use, 
and making sure that there was no friction in that process because every login, every password you have to remember, every app you have to download is just an extra step where you're going to lose patience. I'm a mar- kind of a marketing guy, digital marketing guy. And in marketing, we call that drop off. Every step you add, there's a certain amount of drop off. And healthcare adds a lot of friction oftentimes that isn't necessary. So that's the way that we think about building our business. So the MBA Health Group, if I'm understanding correctly, was a consulting group that helped physicians and health systems deploy these EMR solutions? That was a lot of the business. Yeah, that was the, the business my mother founded. When I joined, it was about 18 employees, but that all scripts relationship that we stood up in 2005, that was my department of one was the, the EHR department. And that okay. department turned into a, a group of 80 plus people. Uh, the company grew to over a hundred people. And that's a lot of what we did. So we had a department doing revenue cycle management, but almost everyone else doing EMR deployments. And so what was your big, biggest win as, as the leader of that, of that group? What are you fondest about or remember the most? Yeah, there's a, we did, we had an amazing team. We worked with all of the biggest health systems that bought the Allscript system and some that were on Epic. Oftentimes we found uh, that we were involved in kind of cutting edge deployments and learning from being on the ground, working on these things. So I guess to answer your question, if I'm looking back, the fondest memory of the MBA times was when we realized that we can, we can learn from what's happening out here in these health systems and we can build our own software because OMD was actually incubated at MBA. We came up with the concept because we were helping deploy patient portals and we thought, why don't we extrapolate conversations, communication outside of the EMR and make it easier or outside of the portal and make it easier. And so that oh. was the aha moment for us where it's like, we can do something bigger I and mean, build our own, our own thing. In hindsight, where do you feel that you, you wanted or you would have wanted to do something different to have a bigger impact? The, the biggest learning for me was that I would have started building software sooner. Consulting is great. There's, there's a lot of opportunity to help a different organization solve problems, but The trouble when you're building a professional services organization is that every time you sell a new customer, you have to hire more people to service that customer. And when you build something like OMD that is scalable and it's a software that doesn't require a new employee for every, every new customer, you can affect more lives. You can, you can help more people. You can build a bigger business. There's just all these, all these things that you can do when you unlock that understanding. And so for me, I I think we would have started doing that sooner with all this inside information on what wasn't working down at the practice level. I mean, nobody else knew that. And so that the big companies, the big EMR companies not see that the portal was something that 70% of people didn't really warm up to? I think they always believed that they could get there, that they could reach certain levels of adoption within organizations. It wasn't that they, that they knew it wasn't going to work and they were just going to keep plugging away. I think they really, almost all the vendors I've ever worked with, continued to build it better and, and push to make it easier to use. And they've done all the right things. It's, it's not a problem. They can, it's consumer behavior. So I, I think that's what it comes down to. What are people willing to do? You know, I, I, I've lived through paper charts to transition to electronic health records. And I think the technology companies are almost a mirror image of the culture of medicine. You can have, I used to work with a company that went out of business, unfortunately was taken over. That was the most perfect EHR, blew any EHR out of the water. This is 2007. It was touchscreen buttons. I could train a physician on that EHR within a matter of two days. It ordered everything. It gave you great progress notes. I think they just didn't have any more. Like you said, you put more customers, they had success. They needed more support. The support was terrible. Then everything went downhill. Then one of the big companies swooped them out, put them out of business, sunsetted a product. I've also lived with the best patient portal that was agnostic to all EHRs. They just connect. 
it just worked. And they didn't realize that they may have realized, but they had population health in there. They had technology potential for telehealth in there. They had scheduling, online scheduling capabilities and the progress notes and all the good stuff that they're talking about today. This is 2009, 2010. Again, taken over, packaged away, put into a vault, never to be heard of again. This is what happens with big companies. You have the little guy. So to me, it looks like big hospital systems that are clunky and bulky and complicated, taking over the little practices that actually are very nimble and can do things. I think true. technology is suffering from that. Very true. And you wrote a book about cardiology and wearables and technology. What, what lessons were you trying to share with your audience when you wrote that chapter? I, I, so I was invited to contribute to that. And, and the point of that was really just to demonstrate what's possible in healthcare that sometimes people don't understand uh, is even a thing. And so I, I think one of the, the realizations, when you think about texting just as a conduit to reach patients, most of what people know texting is used for in healthcare today is appointment reminders and other kind of automated things. Like that's, we all know that exists. It's been around since Televox launched it, you know, many, many years that. ago, right? Yeah. And so that's, that's what we've all kind of come to understand as kind of a use case for texting. And the point of that chapter, to a certain extent, was to demonstrate what's possible. We're 2022, it was 2021 when the, when the book was written. There are different ways to communicate leveraging text that, that are HIPAA compliant, that can be used to improve patient outcomes and just bring them closer to their care team. And so I think that was, that was really the point there okay. was to demonstrate the way technology has evolved and the use case has changed. And now let's take a deep dive into OMD. So, because our audience is pediatricians and there's always this nagging question, can a pediatrician be an entrepreneur or an innovator? And they may not be familiar with, with the concept of an incubator. What's an incubator in the tech world? The incubator, and there's two different, they're, they're somewhat related, but can, can vary depending on what they do. There's an incubator and there's an accelerator. Sometimes they're one and the same. Generally, the concept is these organizations can bring you in. Sometimes they invest a little bit of money in your company and they help you find product market fit. So they help you figure out how to refine enough so that it delivers value that, that people are willing to pay for. Oftentimes in healthcare, these accelerators can also introduce you to a network because as you guys know, you know there's a lot of people in it, but it's still a small world. Like it's, it's, you know, a lot of the same people, we all know a lot of the same people, but the reason we do that is because we've been doing it for a long time. Imagine mm -hmm. if you're younger, you're an entrepreneur that wants to solve a, a new problem and you want to build a network in healthcare. It's really hard to do. It's taken me 20 years to, or, to or, or if you are a 45, 50 year old physician who has a great idea, but yeah. you've never done, you've never stood up a company from, you know, idea to actually renting a space, there's a lot of learning lessons that you, this group of people around you can say, don't do it that way, do it this way. And Definitely. save you a lot of steps and failures in the way, right? Yeah, absolutely. There's so, Business is hard. It's yeah, most physicians are not trained on how to build any type of business. They're trained on how to treat patients. And so why did you choose Blueprint Health as was, is that, that's an incubator or incubator SLA? Yeah, it's, it's a, an accelerator. There were kind of two at the time, Blueprint on the East coast in New York and, uh, in, in San Francisco, Rock Health does a similar thing. They've, they've both changed over the years, but we, we were in New York a, a good amount of time. We had a, a pilot we had, we were working on with Memorial Sloan Kettering in the city and, uh, and Blueprint just made sense for us. I forget what the acceptance rate is. Let's say, you know, 3% of companies that, that apply get selected or, or something smaller. So we were lucky enough to get accepted and it definitely, yeah, helped us, helped us refine our vision and talk wow. to a lot of people and meet new people, meet new opportunities, new prospects. And so when you go for funding at, at the angel level, friends, you know, family and, and angel investors, it seems to me that's the hardest pitch. Once you get a little bigger where the VCs are looking into you, 
I think you got something more concrete to show. H how do you get to the angel investor with a good idea other than going through an incubator, incubator accelerator? It's all, it's all network. Who do you know that can open a door for you? It is harder when you don't have a business. You can tell a big story, but you've never, you haven't proven anything. Most people will tell you you're crazy or that it's not going to work. That's what everybody hears as they go through the process. We, we met some of our early investors through, through friends, just having conversations, have as many conversations as you can. So you have to be an evangelist. You have to, and you can't be afraid sharing information about what you're trying to do and people telling you it's not going to work, right? Like okay. you have to be open to getting rejected constantly. Everyone feels like um, they have to protect their concept. Nobody's going to steal your thing. It's hard to have those conversations openly and you want everybody to sign a, an NDA. But at the end of the day, like no one is going to have a conversation with you and steal your idea. The likelihood is so, so low. But what you miss by being afraid of that is not learning from all the conversations that you could have. So I think that's just kind of something we learned along the way. Yeah, that is a genius observation. Thank you for that. So OMD is its mission from what I understand and see from the outside is have strengthening that conversation between the patient and the doctor in a way that there are no pain points in between it and that you don't have to spend 16 hours in the classroom as a doctor learning how to use it. And the patient, they do this all day long, they text people. And so they don't have to learn how to use it. And this, in theory, if we're communicating better and we strengthen the relationship with your primary care doctor in the case of pediatricians, we should have better outcomes. That's right. Right. That's at, at yep. the heart of it. Okay. Yeah, for uh, sure. It's yeah. But you've gone beyond that. And so now you can put one of those little bots on my webpage that answers some basic questions about the practice to make it more friendly to the user. That's right. Yeah, it's the back to the original conversation we had at the, the start of the meeting. The conversation is what the patient wants. Being automated away is not a good feeling. But if you can deliver some automation in the context of a real conversation, that's something that the patients want. That they're, they just want to be able to send a message and have someone respond when they do. So that's been our focus is really just driving, driving down that path around the conversation and then building more value within that conversation itself. That allows patients not to be on hold, which is the most irritating thing. Even as a physician, when I call another physician's office, I go through the phone tree and then I get someone who doesn't understand what I'm trying to do and hangs up the phone. I just yeah. want to scream. So that you're, you try to stop that. And can you do through some of the texting now appointment scheduling at OMD yet? Yeah. I mean, it's appointment scheduling happens all the time. I think it's really important to recognize is some data from last year that uh, one in five healthcare workers have left the industry. So that problem you just described around waiting on hold, that's been exacerbated. It's not getting better anytime soon. Physicians are leaving the industry. And so now you're hiring you know, folks that are new to the industry that maybe aren't as good to fill some of those gaps. And, and so what we need is efficient ways to have conversations with patients so that care doesn't suffer and outcomes don't suffer. It's an interesting time to be solving some of these problems in healthcare for us, continuing to focus on simplifying, essentially being invisible to the patient. So they don't need to know OMD exists. That's not important to them. They just need to know that they can communicate with their care team. This is important stuff. Did HIPAA scare you in any way when you were thinking about this idea? Yeah, we were thinking about it a long time ago. We had talked, and this may, may come up um, later, but we were talking about WhatsApp as a, a messaging solution. And when I was, I think it was 2010, I had first downloaded the, the app because I had friends in different countries and they were using it to text with each other and it was free. And so conceptually we said, well, why can't we find a way to do this in a HIPAA compliant way in healthcare? 
that was the original idea. So HIPAA, there's a much longer conversation here, but you need consent to text with your patients using HIPAA, or sorry, you need consent to text with your patients for as far as HIPAA is concerned. There are other ways that you can leverage texting through an encrypted link, uh, direct SMS, but you can also use that conduit to launch a video visit, send a form in a HIPAA compliant way. There's a number of different things you can do. So it didn't scare us. It was just a newer way of thinking about how to build around the HIPAA requirements and make sure that, that practices were covered when they were using this thing. But a lot of it is every practice needs consent to communicate with their patients via text. And so that's what the consent forms are for. You can send those out over OMD. You can send, you can have them sign them when they come to the, the practice. But I think it's just a, it's a new way of thinking about how HIPAA can be applied here. Did it scare you that most doctors don't want to be reached at home after hours and how difficult <laughs> they are to persuade to adopt something new? It didn't scare me. It scared every doctor I talked to when I brought this up in the early days and they said, I don't want to be texted at 10 o'clock at night on a Sunday. Actually, it's just a myth. The way that we built the system is build a platform that works for each practice based on their own hours, the way they want to use the system, never giving away cell phone numbers, not requiring the doctor to respond at you know, 10 p.m. at a Sunday, really being able to leverage the folks that answer the phone to respond to text. It is one of the things that we heard in the very early days. Our first practice here in Vermont was a pediatrician in Middlebury by the name of Kate, Dr. Kate McIntosh. And I remember tr having her try one of our earliest products or, or releases. And she asked those same questions. And then everyone else asked those same questions. And so we built because we know that's not something anyone wants to pay for to, to lose their, their sleep time or family time. So how many physicians do you have now that subscribe to the service? We have 650 customers and a customer is a practice or a hospital. So we have, we have customers everywhere, but we also have a free offering that's used by upward of 30,000 physicians and a number of other clinicians on top of that. The platform is really widely used. So we're going to continue offering kind of a, a free level of service to improve healthcare where we can and then build features that people can pay for. As a small business owner, I can afford to give, you know, free checkups to kids. I go bankrupt. So it always interests me, tax companies can do that and how they do that. I don't, that's such a foreign concept to me. Yeah. There's a lot of calculus in there. What does it cost us to run the business or have a free person on the platform? But what is it worth to us at the same time to have someone on it saying good things about what it did for them? We're driving word of mouth in that way, building additional value through that network effect. So it's something we think about a lot and we've thought about a lot. I think it's, it's something we will continue to include in our, our platform moving forward because it's valuable. That's awesome. Now, um, we touched a little bit on WhatsApp because you're right. In Latin America, there's no HIPAA. So my cousins who live in Latin America text their doctor and he, he or she responds, make an appointment with, with, with my secretary and I'll see you this afternoon. Yep. Uh, very simple. And the Latin American culture often responds by voice. They'll record their voice and send you a voice memo as opposed to text it which always. is very different than, you know, the U S space, they always text you back. Then my high performing realtors tell me that the data now from their big lead gen companies, which are tech companies is that what in America is king now is a short video message. If you yep. send through text, a short video message of, Hey, reach out to me about this. You get an outstanding response to that text. Mm -hmm. So I am sure you've thought about these ideas. Will there be a point that I, I will have canned video messages about like, for, don't forget to come in for your physical, schedule it now. Yeah, I, I think that's some, it's something we've talked about. We always try to figure out how to build personalization into everything that we do. So we, as a patient, because we think that's what patients want. They want to feel like you're talking to them not talking to everyone at the same time. So how could you do a one-to-many 
video like that to drive drive engagement and bring your patients in for that annual checkup. I think there's a there's potential there with the technology that exists today. But it's funny. It is funny you mentioned the way WhatsApp is used in South American, uh, Central America countries that that I've seen. You, know, you drive down the road and everyone's got their their WhatsApp number on signs. Yeah. And that's uh, a very different dynamic here. But what's interesting about that too is I think you think about concierge medicine and the experience that patients of concierge doctors have. And if you talk to anyone that has a concierge doc and they tell you about this experience that they had when they were sick, they'll always talk to you about the, you know, they, it starts with a text message to the doctor. Well, I texted my doctor and this is what they told me. I think with OMD, the way that we, the way we want this to continue to work is that we're delivering that level of care in a scalable way to brick and mortar practices, because that's the experience that people are willing to pay out of pocket for if you have the money to pay for it. And so anyway, there's, there's definitely a lot to be learned about how messaging is used between consumers and businesses in other parts of the world, because you know, sometimes we're behind on some of those curves. It's interesting to me, practices that have a great number of Medicaid patients and are Spanish speaking patients won't have their website in Spanish or a WhatsApp business account. And it's a lost opportunity Yeah, because they would, they would get a lot more for their dollar if they did that. We're getting running short on your time and I don't want to abuse it, but I am really very interested. You did a certificate in the side in Stanford. And one of my, I call him the John Ivey of design and healthcare is Mike West in Miami. I don't know if you had a chance to cross paths with Mike. No. Mike used to work for CareCloud, which is a revenue cycle management. They were super focused on what you just said. Design a product that the physician office can use without five days of training because then it doesn't get used. Right. And I, I think it's so important when you think about the med tech space, start by thinking about how you're going to design that. It's gotta be beautiful, seamless, intuitive, just like an iPhone is. If you can't do that first, I don't think that you can be sustainable. Do you think that's right? 100%. A hundred percent. I think we've, in healthcare, we've always, we've had our own way of doing things for a long yes. time that we think it makes us different. We think we don't have to think about user experience design because, and this is changing now, but for a long time, we thought we could do things different because we were healthcare and this is how healthcare works. That's not true. Everyone's a consumer. Everyone knows what it's like to send a text message to someone or to, to use a really nice piece of software design. These are the things we become accustomed to. And so that's how we expect all of our, even enterprise software to work. So it's, it's, it's crucial. What did you learn through the Stanford certificate of design? What was like the one or two key lessons? Boy, it was so long ago. It, it just got me thinking a lot about this exact thing, the importance when building for patients, the importance of simplifying and empathy when you're building software, you have to be able to put yourself in someone else's shoes. So I think there's this concept of empathy in design that some, it's easier for some than it is for others to put yourself in those shoes. But I think we said this to close the loop on an earlier part of the conversation. If you can feel the pain point yourself, if you're building a company, if you know what it's like to be a patient that left a voicemail and never heard back or waited for lab results for five days and never got them, you can build yes. uh, in, in a way that other patients uh, will appreciate because you've been through it yourself. So I think that's a, a really important variable when designing things is to, is to use empathy and put yourself in the shoes of the user. Great. And I have just one last question because I, 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 could, I could stay here for another two hours just talking to you, but the... What book are you reading today? Um, looking behind me here, I, then this other business, this just a business book, your next five moves, strategy. Okay. All right. So nothing too, too exciting, but just what I'm working on. 
do you think that independent physicians, especially pediatrics, which is at the lowest reimbursement rate, will survive the Amazon, Google, CVS of the world? It's going to take a lot of time for us to understand what those things are going to look like. I think we know what Amazon is trying to do, bring healthcare into the home. I think there's this counter movement to decentralize a lot of things that have been centralized because they're better experiences. It's the buy local movement applied to healthcare. I do think that people want a personal experience. It's hard to get that from, from Amazon. It just, it's just hard to do. I, and I think reimbursement drives a, a lot of this, right? Like if, if you, Dr. Bravo, could make it work where you were doing house calls like they used to do, you know, back in the day, and you could spend an hour with every patient or half an hour with every patient, like you would do it. If you could, if you could pay the bills by, while doing that. So I think we, a lot of this comes down to um, how doctors get it reimbursed. I think that, that we'll, at some point in time, it needs to swing back or else we just don't have enough doctors in the system to treat people. And that's a bigger problem. So I, I do think it'll swing back in the direction of reimbursement being adjusted appropriately so that doctors can provide the care that they, that they need to provide to keep people healthy. I, my hope is that, yes, we won't be a, a single Amazon-based healthcare system in the future. My hope is that we have real doctors doing real work on the ground the way that they want and the way the patients are healthier because of. Well, that's a, that's a great optimistic way to close the show today. I can't tell you how enjoyable this conversation has been for me. It's, it's always enjoyable when I talk to you. I really want to thank you for being our guest today and George for co-hosting. Thank you, Ethan. This has been a wonderful hour of our time together. I hope we get to Thank see each so other much. in a, in a space where we're actually not virtual, but in real life soon. That sounds great. Well, George and Herb, thank you so much for having me. This has been great. I looking forward to catching up in the future, hopefully in person. Cool. I hope so too. Everybody right. have a great, great. day. Bye-bye. Thanks guys.